Father God, we thank you once again for another opportunity to come together and to fellowship with one another. Thank you, Father, that as we study your word this morning, thank you for revelation knowledge flowing freely, unhindered, uninterrupted by any satanic or demonic spirit. We thank you, Father, that we decrease and you increase. All of you and none of us. Anoint our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and our spirit to contain your word. And Father, we'll be ever so mindful to always give you the praise and always give you the glory. It's in Jesus' name and everyone in agreement say amen. All right, I'm kind of excited this morning. Um, <laughs> we're teaching on the subject of controlling your thoughts. It's a series that we're doing. And <laughs> I'm looking for my extra eyes there. Uh, <laughs> this series that we're doing, we're on the second teaching. The first teaching that we did was the enemy's only weapon is deception. Now we're teaching on the second teaching. Uh, subject in this series which is the battle takes place in the mind and this is based upon or founded upon the fact that our battle our battle that we have takes place in our thought life therefore we have to control our thoughts and the foundational scripture for this is in second corinthians chapter 10 and i asked duke to put it up in the phillips on the screen on the phillips translation because it says it better. One second, I like this pointer. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. On the Phillips translation, it's, yeah, I see the point. I like that. It said right there. We're going to start right there. It says, the truth is that although, of course, we lead normal human lives, the battle we are fighting, now listen to what it's saying. The battle we are fighting is on the spiritual level. That means that we're not using human weapons. The very weapons we use are not those of human warfare, but powerful in God's warfare for the destruction, watch this, of the enemy's strongholds. And we said that the word stronghold is defined in the dictionary as uh, fortresses. The Greek word for it is arguments. It means to argue, okay, and all that's done in the mind, starts in the mind. Now here it is, it tells us what our battle is. Our battle is to bring down every deceptive fantasy. Now deceptive fantasies it, um, impl, uh, indicates that our battle is in the mind. Because that's where deceptiveness, where, where we're deceived that it starts in the mind. And then it says, in every imposing defense that man erect against the true knowledge of God. So we're also battling man's, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Man's knowledge about how things should be done. We're battling that, and, and that takes place in the mind because man is always trying to impose his knowledge contrary to the word of God. So we have to battle that. We have to, that's why it's important for us to stay in the word of God. We have to keep that word of God coming because lack of knowledge is what destroys our people. Not lack of praise or lack of money or different things like that. It's lack of knowledge the Bible teaches us, right? All right. Then it says, uh, we even fight to capture every thought until it comes, until it acknowledges the authority of Christ. So deceptive fantasies, knowledge, and uh, strongholds, those terminologies let us know that our battle is taking place in the mind. See, the battle to uh, live a love life, a love relationship with God is fought in the mind. And the enemy is, what, what he's trying to do, he's trying to deceive us so that he can cause us to abandon our relationship with God. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. He said, I fear that just as Eve was deceived by the enemy, so shall your minds be deceived and from the simplicity of Christ. And what he's saying is the, the, that the enemy plants thoughts or uses our thought life to try to deceive us into abandoning our relationship with Christ. Amen? So what we're doing is we're, we're, we're the point that we're teaching on to help us understand that the battle takes place in the mind. We're talking about sinful actions are the product of evil desires from within. Okay. 
when the, the evil desires that's in us cause us to fight against one another and it calls us to fight against God. I want to show you this in James chapter 4. And we're going to start right at verse 1 there, right up top. Look at now, this is from the Living Bible. It says, What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from, look at there, the evil desires at war within you? See, when we are fighting one another, when we're unforgiving toward one another, it's because of the evil desires that's on the inside of us. Well, where does these evil desires come from? Where does not, we know it's not from the word, so it has to be from the world. That's why it's important that we spend more time in the word than we do in the world's knowledge because whatever you're spending the most time in, that's what's going to have the most influence in your life. And you find yourself, like James says, you find yourself... Uh, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? And then he goes on to say, you want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. Now, to kill don't necessarily mean that you're going to kill a person, but you can kill them through uh, accusations, profane, you know, different uh, uh, slander. You're talking about them and you're bringing them down because you're jealous of them. So now you make up stuff and you slander them. You even bring up the old person. You know, now they're new people now in Christ. Of course they had a past, but to, but to try to make them look bad, you bring up that past. See, that's the devil using you because the devil will bring up your past to try to stop your future. But what you do is you tell the devil about his future. Amen. That old James is dead. I don't know about you, but that old James, I'm like Paul. Paul said, I have wronged no man. I'm just like Paul. I have wronged no man because that old James died. Amen. He says, you are, all, you are jealous of what others have, but you, can't, but, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Now, remember, all this starts on the inside. You know, you see Duke with a lot of money. So now you, you're jealous of him. You can't have it. So now you start trouble with him. And what you try to do, you know, the, do you, do you, do you know the key to this is to get people out there love walk. When you, Kenny, if, on, on, if, if, if you've been listening at Kenny on that prayer teaching that we've been doing, he's been talking about staying away from strife. Strife is the main ingredient that causes your, that, that, that hinders our blessing in our life because you're getting out your love walk. And you got people that the enemy works through because he needs a physical body to work through that he will use to get you in strife. He'll, they'll say and do things to you to get you all upset, to, to, to get you mad enough. Some people can get so mad they, they, they get physical. Or you may say something that you never say before. You know, all that's to get you out of your love walk and to destroy you. Amen? Are y'all okay with that? Then it says, you don't, have, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Up a little how you do it. You don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. That means that your, uh, when you do go to God, a lot of times we don't have because we don't ask God. And then he's saying when you do ask God, you don't have it because your motives are wrong. I've given a good example. I've, I've, I've experienced, well, I've talked to a couple people who have experienced uh, hurt, so to speak, in the Word of Faith movement, especially during the time with Oral Roberts and, and, and Kenneth Hagin and, and Kenneth Copeland when they was talking about the seed, sowing the seed and you receive. Well, they did it, but they didn't get the results that they saw Kenny them get, so they got mad with the movement. But the reason why this scripture, James tells me, is because they had wrong motives. See, sowing the seed would get you a certain amount of progress, but your heart got to be right. Uh, I think it's 1 Samuel 16 and 7 says that man judges the outside, but God looks at the heart. See, a lot of people are sowing seed just for the purpose of having things. And, and that will work to a certain degree, but it's only going to work. It, it, you, you won't reach your highest potential in that unless your heart is right. You understand what I'm saying? See, we don't do, we don't give so that we can get rich. We give so that the kingdom can advance. But in the process of the kingdom advancing, we get rich. Are you, are, you, are you hearing what I'm saying? So your motives got to be right. God looks at our heart. All right? So I just want to show you that the battle that we're doing, it takes place in the mind. You got to get your thinking right. And the enemy attacks your thinking. 
He, he attacks our thought life. He gets us upset. That's like, a, I, I give you an example. Uh, I call, we have a stove at home. Flo told me not to give this testimony, but I'm a, I, I got to give it. <laughs> we have a stove at home. Yeah, you told me not to say that. And it's a handle on the stove, and in between the handle, see, I'm, I'm a clean fanatic, so I like stuff clean. So I try to, I was going to take the handle off to clean it. Duh, when I took the handle off, the glass and everything just fell. Boom. And, and then it had little side stuff on it. It took me two hours to put that thing back together. And in the process of doing it, I'm frustrated. I, trust me, I'm getting frustrated in this, right? So Flo asked me a question. She said, I wonder why this like this. And the thought came to curse. A curse where it popped up. In, of course I didn't say it, but had I not had control of that, that would have came. I don't know where that came from. My answer to her, if I'd have answered right, would have been one curse word, okay? But I did. I, now, I, I didn't say it, okay? I didn't do it. But the enemy was using my frustration to try to get me to say something that I shouldn't say. Are uh, you hearing what I'm I'm using that as an example to show you that uh, when at our most vulnerable moments is when the enemy will come in. That's why in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, he's like a roaring lion going around seeking. The key word there is seeking whom he may devour. He can't devour everyone. If you got control of your thought life, he can't devour you. So he's looking for those that, because we got cussing Christians, okay? <clears throat> he's looking for, 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 for believers that behave like that so then he can get right in there and plant thoughts in their mind. Soon as somebody upset them, first thing they do is curse them out. Now what, now what, have, now what has that done? It has ruined their uh, witnesses. They took them out of their love walk and it ruined their witness. Now, how are you going to witness to somebody when they done heard you do all this cursing? See, the enemy wants to destroy our witness. He wants to destroy. See, the power that we have to draw people in is through our actions and our witnessing. So the enemy wants to destroy that. And the only way he can do that is to get into your head. All right? Y'all all right with that? All right. So now we've been in James. Go turn to James chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse, we've been reading verses uh, 13 through 15. I haven't made it no far in 14 in three weeks. Man. <laughs> we've, in this, we're talking about how the, how, how the temptation to sin against God starts in the mind. It begins with an evil thought, and it becomes sin when we meditate and dwell on that thought allowing it to become an action. And James is a good example to show us how this process works. James chapter 1, it says in verse 13, it says, Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. And we talked about this. We said that uh, sickness is evil, poverty is evil, you know, uh, fear is evil. God doesn't tempt us with these things. Matter of fact, he doesn't even have, have these things to tempt us with. So when, these, when we're tempted by them, in verse 14, it says it, it's, it, it's, it's from the inside. It's, it's the desires that we have on the inside. Verse 14 says, for each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Now, what we've been doing, we've been dissecting verse 14. And we started with the phrase, drawn away. We said that this describes being lured into a trap. Just as animals can be drawn to their death by attractive bait, evil temptation promises us something good and draws us away from the things of God into destruction. See, that's what, and I'm going to tell you, it, 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 the, the temptation that comes to you has to be something that you desire, or else it wouldn't be a temptation. You know, everybody don't have the same temptation. Everybody don't have the same desires. But the enemy knows your Achilles heel or your weakness. And the way he knows it is because you're always talking about it. You're opening your mouth. See, he can't read our thoughts. We have to let him know our position. And the position that we need to let him know that we're in is that we're in a holy, powerful position. These are the things that should be coming out of our mouth, what God says about us and not how we feel. Bill Wilson is doing an awesome teaching on that. He's doing an awesome teaching on the law of confession. And he's, and he's telling us, I like what he said, this, 
this week, he said that once a person gets saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, this is the main thing that they need to learn is how to control their, what, what they say. Because what you say determines where you, where, where you end up and, 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 and what you receive. And a lot of times we're, we're, we're saying what, what, how we feel instead of saying what the word says about us. You understand what I mean? And then what you're doing, you, by doing that, you're revealing to the enemy your Achilles heel. So now he knows how to tempt you. He knows, he knows how to get you upset with God by attacking you with sickness. Because you, all you do is talk about how bad you feel and, and this and that. So if he can intense that feeling of sickness in you, that will cause you to turn from God. You know, because it's teaching out there saying that God put this on me to get my attention and God did this to, so because I wasn't doing right. If God did it, why are you trying to get rid of it? If you believe God put sickness on you, let it run its course. If it kill you, then it kill you, because that was God's will, you know. And see, the enemy has, has, has this deceptiveness, uh, this, this deceiving way of uh, thinking out there, and, 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 and Christians are buying into it. And the reason why is they're spending more time listening to what the world says than they are to what the Word says. You know, it's a different language. We're, we're, we're part of the kingdom of heaven. And it's a different way of talking in the kingdom of heaven. When, when you get to heaven, well, heaven really coming up, but when we get in heaven, we're going to see that in heaven, they're not going to be talking about how bad things are. They're not going to be talking about how people sick, because you ain't going to see no sickness. They ain't going to be talking about how poverty is, because you ain't going to see poverty. Heaven's language is different from earth language. You can find that in John chapter 3, verse 31. It tells you that. It says that the... Uh, those of the earth speak like those people from the earth. But we in heaven, we speak different. The Amplified Bible really expounds on that. All right? So the first, first thing that we did, we talked about how the phrase drawn away means to be lured into a trap. All right? The second thing that we talked about was uh, uh, the phrase his own desires. And, and, this, and when James said that, he was referring to that strong desire of the human soul to enjoy something that fulfills and satisfies the flesh. And last week, this is where we stopped. Last week we went to uh, Romans chapter 8 and we read verses 5 through 8 where it talks about the flesh being a way of thinking. It's a mindset. It ain't talking about your physical flesh because your physical body is going to follow your thinking. How, what, what, well, however you think, that's how you're going to behave. I think it's Proverbs 23 and 7 says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if I'm thinking a certain way, then my body has to follow that. Okay? Now, we're going to pick it up this morning by saying when we submit to the flesh, we have the tendency to strongly desire whatever sin that would satisfy that flesh. For each individual, the desire can be different. All right? The phrase his own in verse 14, when he says, uh, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. That phrase his own describes the individual nature of lust or desire, which is oftentimes different for each person. See, what may tempt me may not tempt you. All right. Our different desires are a result of inherited tendencies, environment upbringing and personal choices now I do want to say inherited tendencies when you get saved the we, we call it generational curses they're broke but if you don't change your thinking and recognize they're, that they're broke you can still operate in that all right so that that un, un, until we change our thinking the inherent tendencies that that that, that uh, are our primary factor in our desires, our upbringing, how we was raised, our environment that we come from, and our personal choices play a big part in the desires that we want. Everybody understand that? Did, did that make sense to you? Okay. It made faith, okay. That's what it's supposed to do. Now, now, we're going to move on and maybe we get to finish these three verses today. Hallelujah. Now, when an evil desire is meditated upon, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it has matured, results in death. And we find that in verse 15, James 1, 15. 
It says, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death, or we can say negative results. All right? Now, contrary to what most people believe, sin is not merely a spontaneous act, but the result of a process. Some people say, I just, I just, uh, I fell into that adultery. No, you didn't fall in it. You thought about it. You may not thought about it right then, but down the line somewhere, you thought about that. You understand? I heard people say, I, I've heard people, oh, yeah, I just fell into that. It just happened. No, 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 no. It don't, the Bible says it don't just happen. See, you, even though it may not be on your mind right then, somewhere down the line, you've thought about that action that you've taken. And when, you, when it came to you, you didn't deal with it. You, you allowed that to stay there. You allowed that to stay in your mind. And what happened is it got into that stronghold that's in, in your subconscious. Have you ever, I'll give you an example. Have you ever uh, had an evil thought just come to you out of nowhere? See, it's coming out of that subconscious, out of your subconscious, out of those, it's a stronghold back there. And you got, this, you got to tear that stronghold down. So how do, how do we tear it down? By replacing it with other thoughts. By getting out the thoughts of the world and flooding out, and, and we do that by flooding our mind with the word of God. When you flood your mind with the word of God, it washes out those other thoughts that was collected back there. Because I'm telling you, I've, been, I've, I've had people talking to me and, and, and one saying nothing negative, one hurt, trying to hurt me, and the thought came to, 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 to hurt them or to, or to say something mean to them. Just popped in my mind, where that come from? They ain't doing nothing to me, you know. But I knew it was from the enemy. I've been sitting at a red light. And the, and the thought came, run the red light. Now, you know that's from the devil. One time it did me like that. Had I responded, a truck, semi-truck came, whoo, right through. Now, what would happen had I responded to that? I'd be dead. You see? So, see, are you understanding what I'm saying? So, we have to get control of our thinking. It's a process. You don't, you don't, just, you don't just act. Somewhere down the line, that thought was there, and you didn't get rid of it. It's, sin is not a spontaneous act. The terms in verse 15, conceived and brings forth, is likened to a physical conception and birth. It's just like a woman, when she gets pregnant, she conceives, then she brings forth. Well, the thought comes, you meditate on that thought, and then you conceive, and, brings, and then it brings forth the action of that thought. James revealed here that the temptation could follow a similar sequence of physical conception and birth. Conception of the thought of a sin and, and then acting on that thought gives birth to that sin. And that sin, once it matures or becomes full grown, brings forth death or negative results. All right? The process of a temptation becoming a sinful act can also be likened to a snowball rolling down a hill. You ever seen a snowball? I've never seen snow in real life, but I've seen it on TV that the, the, when it starts uphill, it starts small, but the, as it grows down, it grows bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? The process uh, of, of temptation can, can, can have that same kind of effect. Just as a snowball gets bigger and it rolls down a hill, the more we meditate on that evil temptation, the more we empower it to grow in its evil intentions. See, the, that's, that sinful thought has, that, that evil temptation has, a, has, has evil intentions, okay? And the more we meditate on that, the more we allow that to be in our thinking, the, 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 the more the, the growth of that evil, the evil intentions of that thought gets. You understand what I'm saying? Now you're thinking about it, you're meditating on it, for instance, let's say somebody says something and you didn't like it. And you didn't, you didn't forgive them. You, you, you kept it inside. You went home and you start thinking about it. Now that thought came, you know what? You need to go tell them off. Now the more you meditate on that, the more the evil intentions of that thought grows. So the next time you see them, what you think going to happen? You're going to tell them off. Say, oh, I know, especially if you're at work, you say, well, I know... About 10 o'clock, she always go and get her a drink of water from the fountain, get her a cup. I'm going to be right there to that fountain, and I'm going to tell her off. See, you meditating on that evil, tem tem uh, tem uh, that evil temptation, that evil thought, and as you meditate on it, the intentions of that evil thought grows. It intensifies. All right? 
Now, once the sinful thought has become a sinful action, the more we allow the sinful action to have its way, the more powerful and the more destructive and the harder to stop it becomes. Once you allow, once you meditate on that thought and then you allow that thought to get bigger in, in your thinking and then you start acting on that thought, if you don't deal with it, the, the more you act on it, the more you do it, the harder it becomes to quit. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, the best time to stop a temptation is before it becomes too strong and before it begins to develop or mature. And remember, evil temptation starts in the mind. So the best way, to, the best time to stop the uh, evil temptation is in your thought life. Once it comes, you replace it with the word of God. That's how you get rid of a thought. You replace that thought with what the word says about that situation. If you got a thought to want to go and tell somebody off, well, the word says to love them and forgive them. And that's what you have to start saying. You can't think a thought out. You have to speak it. You'll, because your mind, your, 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 your mind pick up what you hear. That's like people... People can read the Bible without saying something. You can read the Bible in your, in your thought life, but you get more out of it when you speak it. Even if you're not speaking real loud, just reading it and listening to your voice give, brings more effect than it would just trying to think it out. You can't think a thought out. A thought has to be replaced with words. Words create images. And what we have to do, we have to get the right images in our minds, and we do that through the Word of God. So the way you get that thought out before it grows is to start saying what God's word says about that. All right, are y'all okay with that? The battle is fought and won in the mind. Now, the next uh, subject in this series that we're going to talk about, we're going to show you how to really uh, win the battle in your mind. We're going to talk about bringing every thought into captivity to the word of God. That's how you win the battle in your mind, and we're going to talk about that. Amen? Father God, we thank you again. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is constantly making a mark in our lives that cannot be erased. Father God, we thank you that each and every day we're drawing nearer to you and you're drawing nearer to us. We thank you that your word is food and we're maturing and developing in our spiritual walk with you. And we're developing in our love walk with you and everyone else. Father, we thank you for the services this morning. We thank you, Father, that when people come in today that they won't leave the same way that they came. We thank you, Father, that whatever need is, 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 that they have, that they will receive the provision for that need when they come. And we thank you, Father. Thank you for the praise team. Thank you for Pastor Chuck as he bring us your word, Father. And thank you, Father, for the congregation, the people here, for we love them. Father, we give you praise and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.